Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Germantown Presbyterian Church. Welcome this morning on this first Sunday of Advent. Welcome one and all, especially if you're a visitor with us. We are delighted that you're here, and we hope that you feel very much at home here among us at GPC. Thank you for being here, one and all. I do invite you to sign the friendship pad that's on the inside aisle of each pew. If you would sign the pad there, put your name, uh, and if you are visiting with us, and you'd like to know more about us, then you can put your contact information down and check that you'd like a, a, a contact. And one of us will be sure to do that, to contact you this week and tell you more about our family of faith. So welcome and good morning to everyone. A few notes, a few announcements before we start our worship. One is uh, just a reminder that we do things a little bit differently during Advent. We have a few added elements of worship. Some of the sung refrains are different from what we usually have during most of the rest of the year. We like to have a little variety to spice up our worship during Advent, so please be sure to uh, consult the bulletin for mainly the sung uh, refrains and the uh, affirmations of faith, which are usually different during the season of Advent. Tonight, I invite you to come to the uh, three church processional worship that will be uh, taking place between our friends at Germantown Methodist Church and St. George's Episcopal, where we will uh, have a a processional worship. We'll start at 5.30 at the Methodist Church, and we'll have a a time of worship in their sanctuary. And then we'll walk over, and uh, you can drive if you need to, but walk over and we'll have be in our chapel roughly around 6 or 6.15 or so, and have worship in the chapel, and then we'll walk over to St. George's across the street and have some worship and a, and a um, reception after over at St. George's. And so you can park at either of the three churches. I'm going to park here, walk over there, and then walk around and then walk back. But you, if you want to leave from the Episcopal Church, you can park over there or wherever you want to park. But at some point, you'll have to walk to one of the churches. But um, park where you like, and then we'll have this processional worship. I'm, in, I'm encouraged by this and excited by this. We're great neighbors 
on this corner. We engage in lots of different acts of service and worship together. So this is a brand new service for us on this corner. And I invite you to come to the Methodist Church at 530 if you'd like to take part. Um, Lots of things happening, uh, of course, in the life of the church during Advent. I invite you to sign up for the uh, Advent Wednesday night devotional series. You'll see a QR code, a uh, way to sign up there in your, um, uh, in your bulletin, or you can check on the friendship pad, or you can call the church office. A great meal at 5.30, followed by devotional studies for uh, children, youth, and adults of all ages. So very much an intergenerational meal, and then fun activities for everybody starting at 6 o'clock. The little children will be preparing for the Christmas Eve service that they lead the family service at 3.30 on Christmas Eve. Adults will be engaged in uh, different devotional studies, youth the same, so please do sign up for that. And then don't forget also, next Saturday, December the 3rd, the our GPC Connect, our parents' uh, night out event, usually is during the day. It's from, 11, from 10 o'clock to 1 p.m. next Saturday, and you can sign up again for that in the bulletin. Children receive lunch. Parents go out and do what they need to do on that Saturday, and uh, children come here and have a really fun time, so I invite you to sign up for that. And then there is no worship works for children today, the 27th, with the Thanksgiving weekend. Children's afternoon programming is postponed. It's off, and so is our youth programming for this evening. They'll be back up and and going. The youth will next Sunday. The children will be on Wednesday night, so please see all of the communication and all of the Uh, uh, outline about these things happening in the life of the church. And then next Sunday, during our morning worship, we have a very special uh, service where it'll be mainly musical, mostly musical with our choir and with uh, guest instrumentalists coming in as well, filling this sanctuary with beautiful music as they sing portions of the Magnificat and play and the choir and Gerald, Alex, our musicians have been working so hard on that. So that'll be a very special Sunday next Sunday at both 8.30 and 11. And I invite you to invite someone to that. And then, of course, in the afternoon at 2.30, we have our annual uh, concert with our choir and Callan Asperian. And that will be in here at 2.30. And uh, we invite you to come to that. There are questions about is that going to be live streamed? And it will be live streamed for those of you who watch at home and can't participate in person for some reason That will be live streamed next Sunday afternoon. Friends, those are all of our announcements, and now we prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Today is the first Sunday of Advent and we light the candle of hope. God's people waited in hope for a Messiah, and during Advent, we live in hopeful anticipation of God's presence in our lives. Advent literally means coming, and we wait for the coming of Christ into the world to renew and restore us. God has promised to give us new life through Jesus Christ, and through Christ, God will also renew the world. The prophet Isaiah writes, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let us pray. Dear God, as we begin this season of Advent, we pray for you to come into our lives again. We pray for the presence of Christ to strengthen the weary and to give hope to the hurting. As we prepare our own lives to see the glory of Christ revealed, we pray for your healing touch on our souls. You are the light of the world, and we pray for your love to reach out to all creation, to us and then through us to all who need you. In the name of the coming Christ, we pray. Amen.
God welcomes all of us to worship on this first Sunday of Advent. May the Lord of all creation fill you with hope as we gather before God this morning. Please stand and join the call to worship. We sing because God does marvelous things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. We join in joyous song and sing God's praises. All creation, the seas, the rivers, and the mountains rejoice in their creator. The whole creation sings because the Lord is coming to establish justice on earth. to reconcile us with God and one another. Let us confess our daily need for God's grace. Let us pray. Patient God, you know how often we make decisions from a place of greed rather than love. You know how often we allow fear to take the place of logic, fanning unhealthy fires in our lives. You know how often we stubbornly hold on to our pride, thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. Forgive us for giving sin a prime position. During this Advent, call clearly to us so that we might, with your grace, silence the voices of sin and shame. Renew us and recenter us with hope, we pray. Amen. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel is that God is for us and redeems us. Through Christ, God accepts us and forgives us. Let us rejoice in our salvation.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As the children come forward, I'd like you to greet one another with the sign of peace. Is it just you guys this morning? All right. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you all. So I want to ask you three different things today if anyone has ever asked you. Has anyone ever asked you to pay attention? Yeah? What about, does anyone ever ask you to wait? Yeah? And has anyone ever asked you to be patient? Yeah. I think all of us, all that. So to pay attention, we have to use our ears, right? We have to listen, and we have to use our eyes because we have to look around. And usually for paying attention, something has changed. Something is new. Something is different, right? Or maybe something is coming, And so I want you to look around the sanctuary, and what do you see that's different? Okay, what is that? The candles, the Advent, the candles of Advent, and the Advent wreath. And that wasn't here last Sunday, was it? No, that is brand new. And what do you notice about the candles? How many are lit? One. How many do you think might be lit next week, next Sunday? Two, and then one after that, three, and then four. And then, do you know where we will be in the calendar in this season of Advent? We'll be at Christmas Eve. So this Advent wreath and these candles are going to help us to wait patiently for the coming of Christmas. Right? So every week we're going to watch these candles be lit one by one by one and then one more. And then you have to come back on Christmas Eve. So come all of these Sundays and bring your parents, but come all of these Sundays so you can watch the candles be lit Sunday after Sunday And that together we can pay attention and we can patiently wait for the coming of the birth of baby Jesus. Okay? All right. Will you pray with me? Pray after me. Dear God, we thank you for this new season. We thank you for this new season in our lives. We thank you for helping us to count down the days until we celebrate the birth of baby Jesus. It is in his name that we pray, and together we say, Amen. Thank you, guys.
Let us pray. Lord, Scripture tells us that you are a patient God, that you wait on us, and that you have time for us. And so we pray that you would teach us how to wait well during this Advent season. Lord, give us your wisdom, especially with these two readings this morning, that we can learn from you what you have to say through Isaiah and through Matthew. Amen. Our first scripture lesson comes from the Old Testament. It is from the prophet Isaiah. We read Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all nations will flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And then they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation shall not lift up nation, sword against nation again, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And then also from the New Testament, we read this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 24, starting in verse 36. But concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, But the Father only, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will it be with the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, because you do not know the day when your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Whenever I ask people what their favorite time of the year is, what their favorite season of the year is, so many people say, right now, fall. It's so beautiful with the leaves changing and their Thanksgiving holidays when loved ones come home for families and their great visits and people build bonfires. It is such a wonderful time of the year, this season of fall. Now, did you know that the church, of course, also has seasons to it? It has seasons of the church year. The calendar year has spring, summer, fall, and winter. But we also, in the church, have seasons. And we have certain things that we do during certain seasons. I was reminded of this this last fall in September when we had our last Wednesday night devotional series. And Don and Linda Jo McKim came to teach us about the special days and the special seasons of the Christian year. Among the many reasons you should sign up for the upcoming Advent devotional series is that you will, you will learn something. Your faith is always enhanced. You learn more about God. You learn something during these devotional series. And it is always so, to me, faith-building. So I encourage you to sign up for this, not only for what you will learn, but you'll also eat great food and share time with church members that you may not already know. But I was reminded of some important things during this last fall series with Don and Linda Joe McKim about these special seasons of the church year that we move through in the annual rhythm of what we do each year. Season of Lent, of course, is at the beginning of the year, toward the beginning, late winter, early spring, and it teaches us the spiritual practices of repentance. 
and contrition and how to self-reflect and how to tell the truth about ourselves and how to how to approach God with a repentant heart for forgiveness, how we can change course in our lives for the better. In the season of Easter, of course, it's, see, Easter is not just one day in the spring, but Easter is six weeks long. And Easter reminds us of the power of Christ's resurrection and that that power is let loose in the world by God. That power is let loose in our own lives and what happens for just for we ourselves when we trust in and believe in the resurrection. Amazing things happen. Marriages are healed and people find new hope for themselves. People find healing. Addictions are overcome. People find a a kind of a new purpose and a new start all because the resurrection of Jesus is, is now alive and at work in their lives. Pentecost comes and reminds us that the Holy Spirit is at work in Christ's church to, to bring about God's kingdom in the world, that God is doing great things in the world through the church, that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, that there are no Lone Ranger Christians, that you can't say, I can be a Christian on my own without the church. There's no place in the New Testament that says that. And so we're reminded of what it means to, to be in a worshiping body, to be part of the body of Christ together and to love and support and, and hold each other accountable and to do the same for others when they need it and they do it for us when we need it. All on account of the Holy Spirit. There's all days, all these seasons of the church year, and then now there is this season, Advent. Advent is so special. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about one of the most important spiritual, one of the most important Christian attributes that we all have, we all need. Some of us have it, some of us have less of it, some of us have more of it, but we all need it. This one spiritual attribute that God is trying to instill in each one of us, sometimes against our own wishes. Advent is all about patience. It's all about patience. This season more than any other is this season when God is trying to build up this spiritual muscle of patience within our hearts, giving us an ability to endure, helping us persevere through through hard times, helping us have patience because we ultimately know who is in control and then we relearn who is not in control. Patience. Jeremy Collier was an English writer who died in 1724. He said, patient waiting is often the highest way of doing God's will. God's will through patience. Marjorie Kemp wrote a spiritual autobiography around the year 1400, and she said, this is an old English wording, but she said, patience is more worth than miracles doing. In other words, patience is worth more than doing miracles. Patience is found at the very heart of God. To be God-like is to be patient. I don't know about you, but I memorized 1 Corinthians 13, this great chapter on love. I memorized it when I was about 12 years old. And, and some people also, maybe you have it memorized and maybe the words just sort of flow off of your lips because you hear it in different places. You hear a lot at weddings. We had it at our wedding, 1 Corinthians 13 gives all of these different attributes about love. And Paul lists all of these characteristics about love, that love is not envious, it is not arrogant, not boastful. Love is not rude. Love doesn't hold doesn't keep score and hold grudges. People who live by Christ's love, they forgive. They're not selfish. But what is the very first attribute of of love that Paul mentions in this. And it's not random that this one is first. He intentionally, intentionally uses this one word to describe what love is more than anything else. Love is patient. Love is patient. It's interesting in the New Testament and and right there in 1 Corinthians 13 and in other places, um, the word Patient there is an adjective. Love is patient. But actually, in the Greek, it is a verb. It is suffering long. That that word is suffering long. And to be long-suffering means to wait through undesirable circumstances. 
And you see this double meaning that we have for the word patient in English. To be patient is to be long-suffering. To be a patient connotes a medical circumstance. If you are a patient in the hospital, then you are suffering from something, and maybe for a long time. A patient has to be patient. Here's one definition of patient. Slow to anger, self-restrained, having the temperament that endures trials and provocations. How patient are you when you are provoked? Another definition is awaiting or expecting an outcome calmly and without discontent. And then we see in Scripture how many stories have patience woven into them. Even if the story is about something else, you can see these biblical characters and how they have to be patient. Abraham and Sarah, it's a story of great patience. God's promise comes to them that they will have an heir, they'll have a child, and they have to wait two and a half decades for God to fulfill that promise. Jacob worked patiently for seven years for Rachel's hand, and then he was tricked, he was provoked, and had to wait another seven years. Joseph suffered long in prison for over 10 years for something that he didn't even do. Hannah, in her sorrow, prayed patiently for God to act in her life. And it's just a parable. It's not even a real story. But who doesn't feel the prodigal son's father's patience as he watched this horizon day after day, longing for his son to come to his senses and to come home? We feel that father's patience because who has not had to be, be so patient with a loved one, waiting for that person to come to his or her senses? You can't do it for them. And if you're not patient, if you try to push that person on your own timetable, then what happens? Well, you know what happens. It blows up. Has God ever shown you Lots of love through patience about you and your life, maybe waiting for you to come to your senses about something. Yes, all of us. I'm about halfway through watching a Netflix series about a struggling family living pretty rough in a rough neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. One of the characters is a young man named Lip, who is brilliant. He never has to try in school. He's brilliant. And he gets noticed by teachers and by mentors. And they make all of these opportunities available for him. They make all these chances and opportunities available, even getting him into college when he doesn't even apply for himself because he's too lazy to do so. They apply for him and they give him this chance and then a job, another chance after chance. And he does well with all of these opportunities until he blows it. Until he just blows it. He blows every chance for success. He can't escape his past and the neglect he suffered when he was young. He can't take responsibility. And I keep watching this series, waiting for him to finally to come to his senses and to get over it and to succeed. You know, and for a lot of us, that's not a, a show. It's real life as we wait on somebody we love to finally break through. Or as maybe God waits on one of us to finally break through. So we're going to look at patience during this series in Advent. We're going to look at patience because this is the one season of the year where patience is very (laughs) counter-cultural. Susie's children's sermon was great because everybody, especially younger ones, want to just rush straight through to Christmas, and a lot of times we want to do that also. But Advent is all about patience. And I hope God will grow patience in each one of us because what Gregory the Great, a great church leader, said centuries ago is still true for us today. He said, true patience grows with the growth of love. If you want to grow in love, then grow your patience and vice versa. In other words, you and I can't increase in our love for God, our love for Christ. We can't develop a strong spiritual muscle of, muscle of patience unless we are willing to do so during this season of Advent and then offer that patience to those around us and to live with patience in all of our ways. So for this first Sunday in Advent, 
We have these two passages before us, and, and they are about patience. You don't see the word patience in them, but they are passages that tell God's people in one way or another to be patient and to wait for the, wait for the Lord. Wait for God because God is, is coming. The passage from Isaiah is about maintaining patience through very difficult social circumstances. When it seems like the world is falling apart all around you, when there's lawlessness, when there is violence, when there is warfare in the world, when society is falling apart, can you patiently endure and keep your faith in God? The gods of the other nations around the Israelites, they seemed to be stronger gods because those other nations like the Babylonians and the Egyptians, they were on the rise. Can you be patient while God appears to be weak or when other gods of our world seem to be winning? Isaiah 2 was written before the defeat and destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonians and the Assyrians before they conquered before the people went into exile, chapter 1, just before this, delivers some judgment and some, some bad news that they're going to face deprivation and warfare and hardship, and all of that is coming. But chapter 2 turns and offers some hope after the destruction. This passage is one of the great ones in the Old Testament. It's one of the great ones in Isaiah, but all the Old Testament, because it envisions a day the latter days, as it says, when God will be victorious. When God will win over the other gods of, of other peoples, the mountain of the house of the Lord, as it says it. Meaning Mount Zion in Jerusalem, which was where the, the temple was built. This mount will rise above all the other mountains of other gods. The worshipers who are other peoples, they worship gods like Baal. They worship gods like, like Marduk, these other cultures' gods. They are built on hilltop shrines, the places where they are worshipped. Well, those hills will descend and the mountain, the hill of the Lord, will ascend and will prevail over all those other gods. But you have to be patient. Isaiah is saying, even though you'll face battles and have a time of war, there is a lasting peace that will finally come by, from God. And it's really one of the great passages in the Old Testament, very famous, where Isaiah promises that one day weapons that are made for human destruction, those weapons will be traded in for tools of human flourishing. Swords that are used to kill people, they'll be reshaped into plows. They'll be reshaped for providing life and food and nourishment. Spears that are used to impale will become gardening tools that prune grapevines and make wine to gladden the human heart. It's all great symbolic language, but it is talking about a day when God will deliver peace and nations will not go to war against nations any longer. I think there are people in Ukraine and also Russia who are longing for that day. I've been churning over and over again in my heart and in my mind what many of us heard a couple of weeks ago when we had two people from Ukraine come and, and speak to us on a Wednesday night. One is a Presbyterian minister named Bob Gamble, and he grew up here and based out of the United States, but he lives in Ukraine half the year. The other person was Olya Balaban, who is a Ukrainian national who runs a refugee program for all those people who are trying to escape bombed out cities especially the women and the children. Some powerful things that they had to say to us, that they know there is more war coming, and they are patiently, patiently waiting on God to provide peace. Even though they know, they know there's more war coming, they themselves, they said, they may have to take up arms to defend themselves, but they are nevertheless praying for and longing for this day in this God who they trust in, even if they have to suffer for a long time, they believe that God will usher in a day of peace someday. 
In ancient Jerusalem, it was falling apart. There was crime. There was lawlessness. Their society was breaking down all around them. And Isaiah says, nevertheless, trust in God. Be patient and God will deliver. And the whole chapter of Matthew 24, of which we read just a portion, it's about Christ's return. It's about this day again in the latter days, these days that we anticipate when Christ will return, where he will usher in this kingdom of love, this kingdom of heaven that is eternal. It says, stay ready in so many different ways. Stay ready like you are waiting for someone to come in the night and break in your house. Be vigilant. Stay ready ready, but you have to be patient. You'll have to be patient even as you stay ready. Christ is coming to deliver. Creation will be restored. Evil will be purged out of creation in God's eternal kingdom. You might have to suffer long and be patient before he comes. Maybe you won't even see it in your lifetime, says one generation to the next, but Christ will keep his promise. Wait for it. And so this is this season when we need to practice patience. It does make us pretty countercultural. Our world is geared against patience, especially with all the technological changes that we've experienced in the last 20 years or so, how we order, how we consume projects, how we get ready for Christmas with our products. It's all about not having patience. Do you remember, by chance, what it was like when you got a catalog and you filled in handwritten pages of what you wanted to order with the order number and you mailed it away and you waited six weeks in order to get that product back? Maybe. Now, if it takes longer than two days, people call customer service to complain. And that's just symbolic of the world in which we live where people prefer force or impatience, or complaining rather than cultivating patience in their lives. Edmund Burke said, you will accomplish more by patience than you ever will by force. But we live in an angrier society with less love because people have lost their patience. When you're patient, you realize how little of your life you actually have control over. You come to appreciate more of the people around you on whom you are dependent, some of whom are dependent upon you. When you are patient, you learn how to love better and deeper and stronger. So what spiritual discipline can you engage in during this season of Advent? Can you keep praying for that family member or that friend who who you keep waiting to come to his or her senses? Can you pray for them a little bit more and a little bit more? Can you give them more time and more patience for them to break through and get stable? Can you refrain from losing your temper or complaining in the checkout line that's too long and the clerk isn't doing things fast enough for you? Can you refrain from complaining in Advent because you have more patience? Lord, give me patience and hurry up. Not that prayer, but a real yearning for anger-reducing, faith-building, love-growing patience. I hope that this Advent season is one where you become more like God because you exercise more patience. Amen. My friends, we've been blessed to hear God's word read and proclaimed to us, and I invite us now to stand and to affirm our faith together using the passage from Galatians that is printed in your bulletin. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God.
Amen. Please be seated. One of the great aspects of being able to enjoy the holidays holidays is getting that quality time. Whether it's with friends or with family or even just ourselves. Because we're pretty busy right now. And whether we know it or not, this morning we've been doing the same thing, getting quality time with Christ. So I invite you to join me as we keep the conversation going with a word of prayer. Good morning, God. Thank you for the quiet beauty of this day, for the rest you grace us with, the clothes on our backs, in this warm place where we get to come and enjoy you together. God, we feel your invitation, your command to wait in this season of expectation. And you know better than any of us how hard that is for us. We are a same-day shipping kind of people, not just in our expectations, in our lifestyles, but even in the urgency and expectations of our souls in our relationship with you. And to be honest, it frustrates us that you don't operate on the same timetable. And yet when we look back, we see, oh yeah, yours was better. And so we lean in to this season of Advent, of actively waiting for you to come and enter afresh into our lives. But Jesus, you know that this is going to bubble up a lot for us. Like being stir crazy on vacation, four weeks of waiting for you. We know that it will bubble up a lot. And maybe, just maybe, that's a part of your good and perfect plans for us. We feel this morning a sense of deep gratitude for the celebrations that we have savored this past week. For the couples that we know who have gotten married recently. For the children who have been born. For the new homes that are being enjoyed. For travel that has gone mostly interrupted. And for the opportunity to take a few days off from work and just be. Thank you, God. But we also feel bubbling up in us that restlessness. Restlessness for peace to come in conflict areas where it has gone one minute too long, like in Ukraine. Even in our own country where we have been racked with a series of gun violence and shootings. God, please let it stop. For all those these days where the clouds amplify the loneliness or the drudgery, seasonal affect disorder, which is such a real thing, and just missing people. We lift you all of these because, one, we're not perfect, but also we are these complex creatures that you've created full of all the feels and all the life experiences, and we come and we lay all of them down at your feet. Come, Lord Jesus, into each of these moments, each of these yearnings of our hearts, and the multitude unspoken, as we pray together the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As an act of worship, 
because we love Christ and we devote all of ourselves to him. He's richly blessed us, and so we have the opportunity to give back a portion through our tithes and our offerings. I invite our ushers now to come forward and receive our gifts to Almighty God.
let us turn to God in prayer. Almighty God, we offer to you these resources that we bring. We pray that you will bless them, that you will multiply them and use them to meet the world's needs. And we bring to you our lives. We give you thanks and praise for the opportunities that you give to us to participate in your life-giving work for the sake of your coming kingdom. All of this we pray in the name of Christ our Lord, and together we say, Amen. Christian friends, go now out into this world to love and serve the Lord and go out to love and serve your neighbor as yourself. And as you go, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and dwell in your heart and in your mind forever. Amen.